today on Growing Through Grace. You know what the world needs today? It needs some Christians who will walk the walk, who will live the life. For now you're living it out when the pressure around you has been turned up to high and the personal cost can loom very large. Listening to Growing Through Grace with Pastor Jacob Bielan of Morningstar Christian Chapel in Whittier, California. And now we pick up the suspenseful story of Daniel as he is confronted with making a choice between obeying God or following the ill intended laws of the land. The punishment for disobeying is to be thrown into the lion's den. Now, Pastor Jack will teach us through the result of Daniel's choice as we turn to the book of Daniel, chapter 6, verses 18 through 28. For this message that's titled, Dare to Walk the Walk. Here's Pastor Jack. Daniel 6, we came to a time of a new world kingdom that had just emerged. The Medo-Persian Empire had taken over by a fella leading called, his name was Cyrus. He was a Persian and Darius. The Mede, there was a, a fellowship, if you will, of two kingdoms. Uh, Medes uh, were really the viceroys, if you will, to the Persians who were much stronger. The time, 539 B.C., the prophecy that Daniel had given in chapter 2 to Nebuchadnezzar that the head of gold would one day fall had come to pass. And the chest and the arms of silver had come to power. In fact, Babylon fell October 11th through 12th, 539 B.C. Well, within three years of that fall, the order would be given by King Cyrus, who would by then be established. His armies would be home, and he would be in, in, in control. He would give the order to let the Jews go home. We told you last week, I think, that Isaiah mentions him by name in chapter 44 and 45, 150 years before he was born. And 50,000 or so Jews took up in 536 and went back to Jerusalem to begin to rebuild that which had been assaulted by the Babylonians beginning in 606 B.C., 70 years earlier. Well, last week as we started the, the, the chapter, and I think we stopped at verse 15, we left Daniel kind of in the lurch there. Daniel is 85 years old. He was one of the three governors that were uh, established, if you will, by Darius as he started to set up a government and they were over 120 princes who were responsible for provincial control. So Daniel was certainly the only Jew, the only captive one. And he was being considered, we are told there early on, by the king to maybe put in charge of the whole realm, verse 3. So we talked last week about daring to be faithful. And we talked about Daniel's faithfulness was consistent over seven decades. It was professional. He worked for two world kingdoms. Imagine having that kind of influence. When these men who were out to get him and take his job desired to find something wrong with him, he could even find, or, or we even learned that he was faithful under extreme scrutiny. Nothing could be found in, in his background or in his life that would have disqualified him. And spiritually, we saw last week in verse 10 that he went to pray as was his custom day in and day out, even though they had been able to convince the king to sign a um, a law that said anyone that did that for the next 30 days instead of appealing just to the king would be thrown to the lions. The two governors, the 120 princes, were very jealous of Daniel. They hated him. Verse 13 said he was a captive Jew. His faithfulness was a hindrance to their upward mobility. They wanted to get ahead. They've gotten in pretty important places, but enough is never enough. And so they wanted to get rid of this POW as competition and they tried to find some dirt, verse 4, on Daniel. They finally decided that the only thing that would work is to put devotion, Daniel's devotion to his Lord in, in direct competition with the will of the king. And so that's when kind of that dastardly, you know, wicked idea came up and they were able to uh, appeal to Darius, who was flushed with power. Nobody had more power really than he. And say, you know, we'd like to sign a, 
uh, proclamation that for the next 30 days no one would pray to any god but you. You're our god, O king. And the king went, I like the sound of that. And he signed it into law. And the, you know, the Medes and the Persians, they had a rule. Once you sign it into law, that's it. The law can't be amended. It can't be changed. And so he signed it. Well, once it was signed, it was just a matter of time before these wicked guys camping out of Daniel's house found him doing what he had always done. Three times every day, morning, noon, and evening, he'd open the windows. He'd face Jerusalem as the Lord had told Solomon that they should do if they were in captivity. He cried out for, to come home, for the Lord to restore for his blessing, for repentance. And they were reported with great glee to the king and reminded him of the order and the fact that their law couldn't be changed. Well, from verse 1 and verse 3, we learn very quickly that the king liked Daniel. He made him one of the three governors, thought about giving him the main job, the VP job, if you will. And now he realized he'd been hustled by his own bunch of men. And he devotes the rest of the day, because at night it would have to be applied, to figuring out a loophole where they could maybe get Daniel out of being thrown to the lions, a law that he had signed, but to no avail. And by the time you get to verse 14 and 15, these men are back in the evening to say, hey, come on, dude, time's running out, you know. It's the law. You signed it. Well, that's where we left off last week. Tonight we want to finish this familiar story by looking back a little bit and also looking forward. And here's our dare for you tonight. Dare to walk the walk. Dare to walk the the walk. The Bible is filled with stories of those who knew God and pressed on in their walks with him to accomplish wonderful things, great things, even in the face of pressing and difficult circumstances. Men and women like you find in Hebrews 11 that, who all walked by faith, they all pleased God. And because of their faith, some received glorious deliverances. Others lost their lives in pursuit of the will of God. But each one of them pleased the Lord. They walked the walk. They saw it through. You know what the, the world needs today? It needs some Christians who will walk the walk, who will live the life. And to walk the walk kind of takes you to that next step of faithfulness, for now you're living it out when the pressure around you has been turned up to high, and the personal cost can loom very large. Would you walk the walk? That's the question. Faithful in extreme circumstance, clutching the promises of God in your steadfastness. William Barclay once wrote, it's the kind of faithfulness that you find with the clutching intensity of a drowning man. Will you hang on to the Lord like that? Well, that's what we want to look at tonight, and we want to kind of go back up to verse 4 for a minute, just because we, we, we want to kind of make one of these points, and that is persecution, if you're going to walk the walk, is going to be inevitable. There's no way you're going to escape persecution if you're going to walk with God. And sometimes, like Daniel, our payment for our faith is extremely unfair, or so it seems. Daniel is facing death for praying. That's it, right? He has been faithfully serving the Lord for 70 years. And if you're going to walk the walk with Jesus in this world, you're going to have to learn to deal with the fact that life is not fair. It's not fair. God will eventually bring fairness and equity and parity and the books will be balanced, but it doesn't always get balanced in this life. It doesn't. We often hear Christian talk in terms of karma, which is really odd to me. Do good and it'll come back to you. Do evil, you'll reap what you sow. And then you want to say to those folks, well, what about Daniel? What about Joseph? Look, life's not always fair. Amber was talking about being in the labor room. I heard a story about two dads in the maternity waiting room anxiously pacing, awaiting the birth of their first child. When the nurse came out and said to one of the men, congratulations, you have a healthy, beautiful baby daughter. And the other fellow said, hey, that's not fair. I was here first. <laughs> well, you get the idea. What happens to Daniel is not the least bit fair. This is not fair. But even though it doesn't seem fair on the outward, he remains steadfast, walking the walk, because he is dedicated to the things of God. So he knew the law was passed. He knew there was trouble coming, but he did what he always did, right? He went to pray. If this is the end of the line, I've had a good run. Get ready, lions, here I come. David would write in Psalm 23, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear 
no evil. Now, I understand that we don't want the valley of the shadow of death. We want the mountaintops. But there's always that valley waiting, isn't there? Learn this from Daniel. Persecution for your faith is inevitable. And you see it in the response of his co-workers. You see it in their wicked devices. You're not going to be able to get through this life serving the Lord without some battle scars and open wounds and persecution from without and from within. Because when the kingdom of light runs into the kingdom of darkness, there's always sparks that fly, right? There's a kingdom clash. Paul, in his very last letter to a very loved and supported and discipled young man at 40 years old named Timothy, said, look, Timothy, if you desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, you will suffer persecution. Those are the words of a dying man. You will that if you intend to walk the way, you're going to rub some people the wrong way. They're going to turn on you. They're going to talk behind your back. They're going to try to marginalize your walk with the Lord. You might miss the promotion. You may not get an invitation to the cocktail party. You might not be welcome at the company retreat. We've been on the radio for quite some time across the nation. We've gotten several death threats. Why? Preaching the Bible. People don't always like to hear it. And there's a lot of nuts, by the way, out there as well. We've had folks show up for counseling with guns in their pockets. It happens, but God's word is powerful, man. And he's doing a great work. If you think following Jesus is going to be easy, you just haven't been reading your Bible. The early church didn't have it easy. I know we love all of those promises of God. We, we have promise books. People have made millions of dollars printing the Bible in promise book form. And you'll never find scriptures like, you know, 2 Timothy 3.12. If you live godly in Christ Jesus, you will suffer persecution. No, that's not in any promise book I've ever found. It's not in there. Or, or Matthew 10, 16. Behold, I send you as sheep into the midst of wolves. Wow, that doesn't sound safe. Be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. Beware of men. They will deliver you up to the council, scourge you in the synagogues, bring you before the governors, bring you before the kings for my sake. You can be a testimony to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, don't worry about what you'll speak in that very hour. It'll be given you by the Spirit of your Father who will speak in you. You'll be hated for all, by all men for my name's sake. Oh, that doesn't sound like a promise verse. It sounds like a warning. <laughs> and indeed it is. So people sometimes say, wouldn't it be fun to have lived in the days of the apostles? Well, not really. Unless you want to be crucified upside down or have be beheaded, probably not a good time. Thank the Lord we're in, the, in, in this generation. Matthew 10, 16, sheep among wolves. Matthew 10, 17, it talks about people delivering you up to the council. There'll be religious persecution. You know, organized religion has always been the chief antagonist of the believer. So if you're going to walk the walk, be careful. Because the religious folks will turn on you. I, I once heard the definition that a fanatic is anyone who loves Jesus more than you do. Oh, those fanatics. In Matthew 10, 18, there's political pressure. It talks about being brought before the governors and the kings. We've been praying for Saeed for a year now, over a year. He's still not out. Fortunately, he's in the hospital, and he's being treated, and those are good things. But the secular world doesn't want anything to do with you either. You know, the Roman government put 6 million believers to death under 10 waves of persecution in the first 150 years of the church. Flung to the lions, burned at the stake, covered in pitch, lit as torches in Caesar's garden, and so on. It wasn't easy. And then there's that verse 21 of Matthew 10 that talks about brother will deliver brother up, and father will deliver up his child, and children will rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. That doesn't sound much like a promise verse either. Family pressure. Families holding funerals for their converted children, spouses, who are set aside. Kids, we, we saw kids in high school, in our high school ministry, getting saved and parents finding out they're saved and saying, well, you can't go back to church now. And the kids are being, you know, put on the, put on the spot. And I must tell you, we tell these kids, you obey your parents. You trust the Lord. You stay home. Now, there's lots of cultures that are far more radical than us. There, there are cultures that practice honor killings when you walk away from one faith to Jesus. So persecution is going to be inevitable. You've got to dare to walk the walk. You've got to know it's coming your way. Second of all, conviction of the truth is essential. Verse 16 is where we left off. 
So the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel, and they cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet of his lords, that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. Now the king went to his palace. He spent the night fasting. No musicians were brought before him. Also his sleep went from him. Notice that the arrest and the bringing of Daniel to the mouth of the lion's den is accomplished with no resistance from Daniel at all. No argument. In fact, nothing is recorded at all. In, in, look at verse 16. It's, it's rather stark. They gave the commandment, and they brought Daniel, and they threw him into the den of lions. You'd like to probably hear more about how that went. But the only words recorded come from a distraught king who had been ambushed and just couldn't make it right. His only hope was now that this God of Daniel that he loved so much and that he was only aware of for a little while because this overthrow had just recently happened would be able to deliver him from these ferocious lions. And, and the king strives to believe and hope that what Daniel had come to know without a shadow of a doubt or hesitancy would be reality in his life. If you're going to walk the walk, you better have a conviction of the truth. It's essential for you to keep going. Daniel could have argued this wasn't fair. He could have brought up 70 years of faithfulness. He could have said, look, I'm 80 plus years old. You've got to be kidding me. Instead, he knew the law. He trusted in the Lord. He did what came normally, not a word of complaint. Like Jesus, he opened not his mouth, and he is thrown into the den of lions. And with, with the clutching intensity of a drowning man, he hangs on to the Lord and goes to face the lions. It's easy to talk a good game. Hard to walk the walk. Walk the walk. How, here faithfulness becomes steadfast when the truth of God grips you with certainty and you can't be dissuaded from his ways no matter what the cost is to you. David prayed when he got found out with Bathsheba, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Let me just walk the walk. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 112, his heart will be steadfast as he trusts the Lord. That's Daniel. You, you have to be sure of the truth to walk the walk. Let me ask you something. What could possibly happen in your life that would cause you to stop trusting Jesus? What if your child died? What if your wife or husband died and they were young? Would that be enough to push you over the edge and just say, no more? What about some lingering disease or an unfaithful spouse or some natural disaster or just a loss of your job or maybe you've lost your home? Where do you go with your faith then? If you have a conviction of the truth, there's really nothing that can shake you away from who he is. It's not fun. It's not easy. It's not fair. But where else can we turn? What would it take you see, to walk the walk requires a conviction of his truth that decides life for you. We've known people that have come and gone here, some folks who have lost loved ones, and because the Lord didn't intervene, they walked away from the Lord, and they haven't been back since. And when I've had a chance to talk to them, I said, look, what are you doing? You know, you're going to die someday too. You're going to have to let God be God. I'm sorry for your loss, but eventually everyone dies. Job lost his estate, lost ten children, wife turned against God, friends turned against Job, health really wasn't very helpful, and yet he was able to force out the words, naked came I from my mother's womb, naked shall I return there. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. That's horrifyingly difficult to say, unless you know the truth. Twelve chapters later, same book, Job 13, verse 15, though he slay me, yet I will trust in him, and even so I'll defend my own ways before him. I'm going to talk with God about it, but I'm going to submit to him. He walked it out. Well, look at the king in verse 18. He really had no truth conviction, and so he spends the night far more difficult than we will learn Daniel did. He's in far worse shape than Daniel was. Daniel just jumped in. 
The king can't get any rest. He's up all night. There's no music. There's no food. He is guilt-ridden. He's been duped by who people he called his friends, those he once respected. Conviction of the truth is essential if you're going to walk the walk. Persecution is inevitable. Conviction of the truth is essential. Thirdly, here's an important one, deliverance is possible. Deliverance is possible. Verse 19. The king arose very early in the morning, and he went out in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting, weeping voice to Daniel. And he said to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? You know, we tend to develop fairly low expectations of God over time. I don't know what it is about us. that Maybe it's just that faith that doesn't grow. But oftentimes, like this king, we seem to hope against hope, but resign ourselves to the fact that we lose. We're defeated. We're not going to get over this. We're not going to get on top of this. God is not going to really answer our prayers. And yet, God is more than able, and we should keep in mind that deliverance is possible with God, who oftentimes does glorious things as we depend upon him. We should expect God to do great things. We should expect God. Daniel's king did so out of great fear. Daniel was willing to jump in in whatever the Lord wants to do. So with little hope but in great despair, the king arrives at the break of day to inquire if Daniel's God had indeed been able to deliver him from the mouth of these lions. We're not told how Daniel spent the night. I don't know if he sat across from a menacing, growling, you know, lion with spit dripping off his canines, or if he used Leo for a pillow. I don't know. <laughs> Daniel does tell us here in a minute there was an angel of the Lord who specialized in lions that had come to shut them up. And, and, and Daniel says it's because I did no wrong before God or before the king. Verse 21, Daniel says to the king, O king, live forever. Imagine the moment of truth as the king calls out, and then there's that momentary silence as everyone leans forward to listen to any signs of life, and then the smile on his face when old Daniel, that 85-year-old boy, says, oh, king, you're good, I'm good, we're good. God delivers the innocent, he's delivered me. He said in verse 22, my God has sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me because... I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. I love the explanation. Verse 23, now the king was exceedingly glad for him. He commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den, and Daniel was taken up out of the den. No injury whatsoever was found on him because he believed in his God. What a great line, isn't it? I'm innocent before God. I believed in him. Here's the explanation for his remarkable deliverance. He believed in his God. To walk the walk not only requires faith, but it has to have a belief in it that, that realizes deliverance from God is possible. That You have to leave room for the miraculous rather than just, oh, you know, I always pray nothing ever happened. I don't know. It's hard to walk the walk if you're not anticipating what God might do. And we need to leave room for that, don't we? Rather than giving way to what we see as inevitable from our point of view. And with that thought, we'll stop there for today and pick up the balance of Daniel chapter 6, verses 16 through 28, the next time we're together. This has been the first half of a two-part study taught by Pastor Jack Abelin. If you'd like to get the entire message, we do have that available for you. All you need to do to order is simply contact us and ask for study number 1528. It's always helpful for us to know the radio station that you're listening to, so be sure to mention those call letters when you get a hold of us. And as we're studying through the book of Daniel, you may realize that perhaps no one in the Bible possessed a more resolute faith in God than Daniel and his peers, who never took the easy way out, but stood their ground even in the face of death. Now, there's lots to be learned from Daniel about his unshakable faith. And as a respected Bible teacher, Warren Wearsby unfolds both the explicit and implicit teachings from this account of Daniel's in his book that's titled, Be Resolute. In this book, Warren Wearsby takes the example of Daniel and his peers to help all of us to a more practical and resolute faith. 
So if you'd like to order Be Resolute by Warren Wiersbe or to get today's study, just dial our toll-free phone number at 866-88-GRACE. That's 866-884-7223. Or you can order by mail. Just address your letter to Growing Through Grace, P.O. Box 1954, Whittier, California, 90609. And as always, this and all of our resources are available online at growingthroughgrace.com. That's growingthroughgrace.com. That's going to wrap up our time together today. We do thank you for being with us. So until next time, as you daily walk with our Lord Jesus Christ, may you continue to grow in His grace. Growing Through Grace is a listener-supported ministry brought to you by Morningstar Christian Chapel in Whittier, California, a Calvary Chapel outreach.